this final instalment, I want to take a look at the final two devices in my chain. And the first of those is the Exciter. Now, what does the Exciter do? Well, effectively, it's adding harmonic distortion to the audio. This is something that can really add life and urgency to the audio. Again, like lots of other elements of mastering processing, if you take it too far, it can really cause havoc. But it's something that if you use it in a subtle way and really listen to what it's doing, it can add a huge amount. Now, I think it's the module that's the most misunderstood out of all the Ozone modules because when you first instantiate it, everything is 100% wet. You can see here we have our dry and wet balance for each band. So like the, like the, the Dynamics and the Imager, this is a multi-band processor. And I think the problem is, we start off with 100% wet. So for example, this band here, so this is this, with the vocals and stuff in. If I turn this up, See, it's really harsh if we do it with this band as well. But what I find is that if we do these changes in parallel, so if we set these to 50% mix, so this is 50% dry signal, 50% wet, then it's a lot more usable straight away. So if we get where the beat comes in. And I find that's when you start to get really useful stuff going on, especially in the high mids and the highs. It can be used sometimes to warm up the low frequencies a little bit. So let's load in the way I've actually been using it in this master, and we can see what I've done here. So there's a couple of uh, important changes. I've turned on this oversampling option, and this essentially oversamples the track so that it's internally running at a very high sample rate, meaning that it should maintain all of the subtleties of the changes I'm making. I'm not gonna lie to you, it's not the kind of thing that when you turn it off, you turn it on, you can hear the difference straight away, but I've got the processing power to spare, so I think it's best to use this. Um, you can see that my mix on everything is, uh, well, my, the ones that are doing the most of the work, these two here, are set to 50%. And then I've got a tiny, tiny little bit, 5% here of this low mid. I've got nothing going on on the bottom end. I didn't really think that needed too much doing to it. But one of the other really important things is that, again, I'm working in MS here. And the reason for that is I wanted to really focus in on exactly how I'm changing the, the excitement on each band in the mids and the sides. So if we look on the side, I'm doing a lot more processing on that low mid band there. Whereas in the mids, I'm, I've got the mix right down. So let's have a listen to the sides first. So it's kind of subtle, but really mainly what I'm doing there is I'm really trying to push the, the the brightness, the the power, well not the power, more like the focus of that high mid, that's really what I'm looking at. Because that's, if I push that all the way, that's what we get. So it's very harsh, but I'm just using a little bit of it. You'll notice I've set this to tape. I, I just found that using the tape excitement mode seemed to work really well for this track. And then with the mid section here, So this, you can hear that makes a quite a big difference there. Let me just reload my preset. So really I feel like in the sections with the where the beats are kicking off, just listen to the snare and the hi-hats. When it's turned on, they're just being pushed a little bit more forward. They're cutting through a little bit. And again, let's AB everything. Get... 
So I'm really pleased with that. I just feel like I'm bringing all of the beats really into focus. A bit brighter. It's less woolly in the bottom end. So for me so far, this is great. This is working really, really well. But as I said, I really do find that the, a lot of people really struggle with this module and they think it's useless. But I think it's because the default is 100% wet on everything and that's very hard to control. So I really do believe in mixing a little bit of this in in parallel. And also, for dance music especially, I think anything where the bass end is crucial, the mid-side processing on this works really, really well. So let's get the final piece of the puzzle in, and that's the maximizer, which is the ozone language for the limiter. And this is very familiar if you've used Ozone 4 or 5. Everything's laid out pretty much the same. There's some new modes that have been added. In the latest uh, Ozone 6.1 updated, they've added this tube limiter mode. And everything is pretty straightforward. We set our ceiling here. We've got our threshold here, and as I pull it down, it will start to get much louder. I am six feet under now, and I'm struggling to get myself out. And we've got this true peak limiting here. This is essentially the same as in Ozone 4 and 5, using the option for uh, detect intersample peaks. So this is just something that I always use, especially if it's something that's going to be loud a lot. This is just going to prevent any possible uh, clips in the analog domain. It's really important to leave that turned on, I think. Now, let's load up my preset for this. So you can see it's really pushing it quite hard like in terms of volume. But if we look at the actual amount of limiting that's been done, it's not humongous. You know, it's not super, super radical. And this is something that I really like about the maximizer in Ozone 6. So if we take a look at our meters, we can see the peak obviously is minus 0.1, that's what I've set my ceiling to, that's just an old habit. Um, older digital converters didn't really react very well if they were fed 0 dB full scale constantly over a long period of time. So I've always been in the habit of reducing the ceiling to minus 0 0.1 or 0 0.2. Um, I've read a lot of writing that suggests we don't need to do that anymore, it's just a habit uh, I've got into. And if we look at the RMS, we're getting about minus 5 dB RMS most of the time when the beat's going, and that's really loud. Really, really loud. You will see some commercial masters which are more like minus 3, uh, or minus 3 or even minus 4. Um, but the thing to remember is that the loudness potential of the track always starts with the mix. There is no foolproof method to say that every track you master, you'll be able to get up to a certain really loud level. Some tracks will sound loud and fine, but the RMS will be a lot lower than this, so it might be like RMS of minus eight. But it, for that track, it may well work. This track, it just so happens that I think it, it reacts very well to the, the maximizer. So let's do an AB and see what we've got. I'm going to go back to this just before the, the beat drops in the, uh, the initial drop there. So I'm going to start with it on and then I'm going to turn it off and everything will go grey when I bypass everything. And remember, because I've got that little ear button turned on, it will add gain to make sure that the level is the same. Here we go. So, I'm really happy with, overall, the change that I've made there. I just feel like I've brought all the beats and the higher frequency elements into focus. But I'm listening to it now and I'm wondering if there's a couple of little bits that I might need to just pull back on. Just going to pull the exciter back a little bit here, in the mid high mids and the mids. I'm 
might start tiny little bit more as well. Let's A B that again. Yep, that's working nicely for me. Let's check it in mono. Great, so I'm really happy with that. That's that's working absolutely fine for me. I really like the amount of focus that we've managed to be able to bring to that. Now, obviously at the end of the mastering process, when I go from 24-bit, which obviously this, this is, I always tend to bounce out mixes at 24-bit. And whenever I'm mastering for anyone, I, I always say, if you've got it, I want a 24-bit version of the mix. Obviously now I want to dither it down to 16 bit. So when we do that truncation from 24 bit to 16 bit, there is a risk of quantization errors. It's usually something fairly subtle, but I find that if it's very, very loud music, like dance music like this, you do have to be careful. So I've turned the dither on here and uh, I'm dithering this down to 16 bit. And then we've got here the dither amount. At the moment it's on medium and if we look over on the bit meter here you can see the dithering taking up uh, intermittently the first few bits there. Uh, if I put that on low we can't really see that working. Strong is pushing a bit higher up. I think for this track low is going to be absolutely fine. It's really really going to be fine and I'm going to turn on limit peaks because this can just help limit any uh, real nasty high frequency peaks that can be contributed to by the dither process and I think really we can leave this as it is let's just have a quick listen Yeah, so that's great. I'm, I'm happy with where we've taken this so far. So I'm going to render this master and there should be links in the video or in the description for you to be able to listen to the unmastered and the mastered versions. So I hope you've enjoyed this little insight into mastering a track with Ozone 6. I think Ozone 6 is a really powerful tool. It's by no means the, the only tool you should ever be using, but I really like being able to host plugins in it as well, so I can mix and match between plugins and the Ozone modules. But there are a few elements of Ozone that I really think are terrific. I think the, the maximizer is terrific. I really like the, the multiband processors. So I really, really think it's worth checking out. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you again soon.